In the last episode, I started restoring this old Osborne 1 computer, and I managed to finish the keyboard. And although it looked better, the keys came out sort of marbled looking. In this episode, I'm going to be tackling the rest of the computer. So let's get right to it. The first thing you need to do to disassemble an Osborne is to remove these knobs for the brightness and contrast. Then you can remove the screws holding the face of the computer on. And it just pulls out like this. Mine has a composite video option, and I'm not sure if that's standard or not, but anyway it has to be unplugged. Anyway, then the rest of the face just comes off. Next you need to turn the unit upside down, and there are five screws to remove. And believe it or not, that's all you have to do to take the case off. These pieces in the back just slide out. Uh, there's a little ground wire here that needs to be unplugged. And this entire handle piece just comes right out. Notice that around the edge you can see the original color of the Osborne, where it has not been exposed to UV light. And with any luck, I can get the rest of the case to look like that. I'll need to remove this ribbon cable for the floppy drives. And although this looks really similar to ribbon cables on PC floppy drives of the era, this cable actually provides power as well as data. The logic board itself is just held in by four screws. Just need to unplug power and the video cable. OK, so once the logic board is out, I can remove the rest of the case. There wasn't anything holding it on, it was just sitting in there, but I didn't feel comfortable having the computer sit on top of the logic board, so that's why I took it out first. Taking a look at this board, you may notice this large daughter board. This is actually an aftermarket product that gives the Osborne 80 column video. The other small daughter board you see here is another add-on, although this one is from Osborne itself, and it's a double density floppy controller. You see the early models could only use single density disks. I'm sorry I didn't get a better photo of that, I had meant to get a better shot and never got around to it. I'll just deroute this uh, floppy ribbon cable and remove it. And now I'll give you the first look at this tiny little CRT. It's quite long compared to its viewing area. The next thing I needed to do was remove these floppy drives. Normally if you were just wanting to retrobrite the case or something, you could just leave these in, but one of these drives is not working, and so I needed to remove it and have a look. And here's what these things look like from the underside. The belts are still good on both of the drives. Now I'm going to unplug this power supply. This is the last component that I will be removing. It's just held onto the case by four screws, and there it is. I'll just cut this zip tie here and it'll be free. These mains power lines look like they're soldered in, but they aren't. If you pull like this, they'll pop loose. Okay, so the power supply is finally completely removed, so let's have a look at it. See this capacitor here? This is the one that blew up and filled my house with a horrible smelling smoke. I had to open the windows and turn all the fans on to get the smell out of my house. Apparently this is a common failure on this. In fact, a friend of mine had warned me not to even use the computer until I removed that capacitor. I didn't take his advice and well, <laughs> sure enough, after about 10 minutes of using the computer, it blew up. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove it now. The interesting thing, and I suppose it's good news, about this capacitor is that it isn't really needed. It's a line filter capacitor that filters the AC power going into the Osborne. It's like your appendix in that if it ever gives problems, it's best just to remove it. Some soldering wick made quick work of this, and uh, the capacitor came out very easily. And here's what it looks like. It apparently blew up from both sides. Okay, next on my agenda is to clean the CRT. It's hard to tell on camera, but it's pretty dirty. And the trouble is, there's this plastic cover that sort of hovers right in front of the CRT with an air gap. So dust and stuff can accumulate between the two over a long period of time. It's just held on by double-sided tape. I just removed the tape and then followed up with some alcohol to get the sticky goo off. And that seemed to work pretty well. I was finally able to clean the CRT, probably for the first time ever since this computer was made. And now you can see this little cover. And even still, it's hard to see on camera, but this thing is filthy. So I'll give it a good cleaning with Windex too. Okay, so I had some double-sided tape in the house already, but I noticed it was only half as thick as the stuff they used, so I just took two pieces and stuck them together. and. I think that'll work just fine as it almost perfectly matches the thickness of the original. I had to be very careful placing the cover back on because I would likely only get one shot at this to get it lined up correctly. This sort of tape isn't very forgiving if you want to pull it back off. And there we have it. I think that'll make the video image much cleaner now. Next I wanted to turn my attention to these floppy drives. 
They have these little metal covers on them, which I thought I should remove to have a better look. And it looks like I accidentally left the WordStar disk in this one. So, there were two problems I had to deal with here. One was the drive motor itself. It was seized up and wouldn't spin. But once I managed to rotate it a few times with my fingers, it broke free and now it seems fine. And the other problem, believe it or not, was the head mechanism here was seized up on these rails and wouldn't move. Again, after I broke it free, it will now move, but it's still very stiff. So what I'm going to do is use some of this lithium grease, and I'm just going to put some of it on these rails here in all four places where it makes contact. And it doesn't need much, a little goes a long way. And then I'll just need to move the head back and forth a few times, and I can immediately tell after the third or fourth time I moved it that the amount of friction has been greatly reduced. Yeah, now it's moving a lot more easily. I did this to both drives and also lubed up every other part I could see that might need it. Okay, so next I wanted to turn my attention to this yucky power panel. I needed to remove the plastic bezel and there appeared to be just two screws. However, I realized that there were two more under this old crusty sticker. And since I don't even know what the purpose of the sticker is, I just decided to remove it completely. Alright, so with the two parts separated, it will be much easier to clean. My first goal should be to get rid of the rest of this sticker, but some of it's holding on for dear life, so I'll spray some WD-40 on there and let it sit for a few minutes. That helped a lot, as I was able to easily peel the rest of the large pieces up with no problem. After that, I could just rinse the whole thing off in the sink and use a scrub brush to get some of the more stubborn gunk. And just drying it off now, I can already tell it looks a hundred times better. So yeah. And there we go. Sure, it needs some Retrobrite, but it looks much better already. Uh, this metal piece here was gross too, so I just sprayed it down with some Windex and it cleaned right up. And here's this piece, all finished up. Next, I'm going to take a look at these two smaller pieces. This is the carry handle for the computer, and uh, this piece here is the power port cover. And it's really too bad I can't unscrew this handle from the plastic. It appears to be riveted in place. So the first thing I'll do is just clean it up as much as possible. And it already looks tons better. The little metal covers are also all rusted up, and believe it or not, I scrubbed this one here with just alcohol and managed to clean it up quite a bit. You can see how it looks compared to the other one, which I haven't yet started on. I actually came back and followed that up with some baking soda and worked it over with a toothbrush for several minutes. And we're about to find out how effective that was. You know, it's, it's not bad, actually. It doesn't look new, but it looks much better. Moving on, it's time to tackle the main case. I started with using the hose outside as it was the quickest way to get most of the dust and gunk off. I followed that up with my usual Windex and alcohol routine. But I wanted to show you some of the pieces had black spots like this that refused to come off. And a lot of people always tell me to use a magic eraser for those, but I prefer to use baking soda. I've just found that it usually is easier to work with, even though it does leave a mess. Plus, it's cheap and available almost anywhere. And as you can see, it worked pretty darn well on this. And I had the same issue with the main case as well. As you can see, I, I tackled it with some alcohol, but still ended up with lots of little scuff spots. So I ended up using baking soda on pretty much the whole case. And this took a good 20 minutes to do, but the results were very good as you can see here. Okay, so here are all of the parts that are going to require retrobriting. Now, I have a few things to say about the retrobrite process. I have had hundreds of emails telling me supposedly better ways to do it. I've been wanting to try some of these, but at the same time, I feel like some of the suggestions are risky, and I don't want to try them on something I care about. Uh, I'd rather use a technique that is tried and true, at least for me, so I'm going to be doing this my usual way. Granted, my keys turned out marble looking using this technique, but the keyboard case itself was fine, and since these are all the same type of plastic, it should be fine as well. The first part to finish was the power panel. It had the least amount of yellowing, so that isn't surprising. After rinsing it off, I went ahead and mounted it back to the metal parts. So, at this point in the project, everything was going pretty well. I mean, I'd managed to clean the screen and remove that blown capacitor. I even got both the floppy drives working. Uh, and I even managed to shine up those little metal pieces. So, I mean, things were working great. Unfortunately, this is kind of the point in the project where things went downhill. The first problem I noticed when checking up on my Retrobrite was that the leather handle seemed to be coming apart. So I thought I'd better end the treatment on this part early and rinse it off and have a look. 
So this is not done retrobriting, even though you can tell it looks better. But I wanted to get a look at this leather, and it appears ripped in places. And I started to wonder if it was like that before, and maybe the retrobriting just made the material underneath a brighter color so that now it shows through. But I went back and examined some earlier footage, and you can see that is definitely not the case. So the peroxide was definitely damaging the leather here. So in theory, I could get some new leather and recover the handle with it and stitch it all together, but I don't really know how to do that very well. Uh, I'm going to look around and see if I can find somebody who maybe can do that for me. Um, I don't think it should be too difficult for someone who's experienced in working with leather, so that's something that can be fixed. And by the way, when I show mistakes like this, it's so that you guys won't make the same mistakes. So another lesson learned. So the case had been out in the sun for about four hours and I thought it was time to rinse it off and have a look. So even though these pieces are like 90% complete, you can see they're suffering from the streaking effect. The main case had some too. Several people had been suggesting to me to stop using the plastic wrap and just apply the cream directly to the surface. Now keep in mind the entire purpose of the plastic wrap is to keep the peroxide from evaporating, so with this method I would have to come out every 5 to 10 minutes and apply fresh cream and spread it all around with a paintbrush. So essentially, you're making a trade-off between how much time you spend working on it and the end result. I could tell that after just 30 minutes this stuff was becoming very thick, and even though I had already added fresh cream several times. Oh, and I uh, left a bunch of cream on my driveway that I had to rinse off. And here's the result. Yeah, it looks terrible. In fact, it actually looks worse than it did after my first treatment using the plastic wrap. And here's one of the smaller pieces. So it's no secret that the best way to do retrobriting, at least all of the methods currently known, is total submersion in hydrogen peroxide. The problem is with the larger items you need a really big container and quite a bit of hydrogen peroxide, so it isn't really feasible. But I thought I'd test these smaller pieces and see if I could fix the damage. The bag started leaking, so I eventually switched this to a little container. And after a few hours in the sun, I rinsed it off and you can see this piece definitely looks better. I also did this other little piece and it looks better too. Not perfect, but better. So I think that proves that it's possible to reverse some of these streaks in the future when I develop a better method for handling these larger pieces, but for the time being I decided just to go ahead and reassemble the computer. I don't have any more time to mess with these case pieces right now, but it's something I plan to revisit in a few months. On the bright side, this computer is very easy to take apart, at least as far as the case pieces are concerned, so there's definitely no harm in reassembling it. And so here's the final result. Some parts of the computer look almost brand new while other parts look streaked. But at least the computer is clean now and it doesn't make me cringe to use it. This part here actually looks really nice. And so does this rear power port area. I'll go ahead and power it on. And you can see the screen is nice and sharp. So I wanted to take a moment to talk about what actually causes the streaking, whether you're using the plastic wrap or not. Imagine a cross section of the retrobriting process Here's your yellowed plastic, and here's your plastic wrap, and ideally you'd have a perfect layer of cream in here. Well, it doesn't really work out that way. In fact, it's more like this, and all those raised areas have more peroxide, so it will react more with the plastic making bright spots. And these lower areas have less peroxide, so it will become spent faster, leaving dark spots. If you forego the plastic wrap, you get a similar problem. Let me demonstrate with this mustard. Now imagine after a while it's already reacted with the plastic, and I'll represent the spent chemical with this ketchup. Now I can come back and add in more fresh peroxide and mix it up, but you'll see streaks between the old and the new. The trouble is, with the peroxide, both old and new look exactly the same to the eye, so it's hard to make sure it's mixed up properly. Well, what was supposed to be a single video ended up turning into a two-parter. And now it's going to turn into a three-parter because, again, this has taken longer than anticipated and I really wanted to spend some time showing you what you can do with an Osborne and talking a little bit about CPM and the history of these machines and whatnot. And so I've decided to split that off into a third episode. And no, it's not some episode far into the future that I might make. I'm actually working on it right now. So just stick around a few days for that and uh, thanks for watching.